My company has to be for consultants. Most of what we do these days is related to greenhouse gases and mostly related to modeling uh, systems uh, from a greenhouse gas perspective. So today I want to talk a little bit about Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. We heard a bunch about that uh, this morning. Uh, I'm going to talk about biofuel uh, life cycle emissions uh, and then a little bit about uh, the Western Canadian advantage because uh, it turns out there's a few things uh, we can actually do quite well here. What I've done here is I've overlaid Canada's greenhouse gas emissions with the greenhouse gas emissions to the United States. So the U.S. has about 10 times as much GHGs as Canada. The scale on the right is the U.S. It's 10 times the scale on the left. And the scale on the left looks kind of funny because I just uh, adjusted the start and the end so that the 1990 emissions uh, line up. So if we had done as good a job as the Americans who have had no uh, programs to reduce GHG emissions, uh, we'd be 100 megatons a year uh, lower than what we are today. Um, so, you know, we, we have an interesting uh, political situation south of the border uh, where a lot of people think a lot of things will get rolled back. They're not interested in GHG emissions. Uh, I'm not sure that's necessarily the case because they've actually done not a bad job of reducing their GHG emissions with no government policies leading up to this point in time anyways. Uh, so biofuels is mostly looking at transportation and so here's what what's happened to the just the gasoline portion of uh, uh, this is all road transportation so this is gasoline and diesel so about 40 percent higher than they were in 1990 but it's actually sort of leveled out um, in the last uh, five years so if we sort of dig down to the numbers a little bit more here's gasoline GHG emissions uh, I'm not quite sure what happened to uh, Canada's inventory in 2013 because that number going way up uh, doesn't make uh, any sense to me. I think there's a spreadsheet error or something. Um, but we've actually reduced our gasoline uh, GHG emissions from the tailpipe. Uh, and so this graph here shows the emissions in the blue line and the sales in the bottom line uh, and so the, the gap between them um, has narrowed which means that we've been reducing the carbon intensity of the fuel uh, that we're burning. Uh, and that is related to biofuels because we don't count the CO2 that comes out the tailpipe uh, when we burn biofuels just as we don't count the CO2 that came out of the atmosphere to grow the feedstock for the biofuels. Uh, diesel emissions, uh, looking just at the diesel, I mean they've got up two and a half times uh, in that 25 year period. So this is where uh, all the growth is in the heavy duty sector. Uh, we're not using as much biofuel in the uh, diesel sector. Um, so while there has been some uh, reduction in the gap, uh, it's actually I think uh, mostly engine technology that has reduced N2O emissions uh, to make them make them closer. Uh, but in the last few years when we have used a bit of biodiesel, um, you know, we see the numbers getting uh, close. But all of that stuff only looks at, doesn't look at it from a systems perspective. So it only looks at what's coming out of the tailpipe. It doesn't look at all the work that has to go into the system uh, to get it up uh, to the tailpipe. So it uh, doesn't include taking the oil out of the ground, uh, maybe upgrading it to synthetic crude oil, refining it, uh, and getting it to the point of combustion. So if you look at sort of the headline number, 25% of the Canada's greenhouse gas emissions are for the transportation sector. Well, the real number is probably 35 to 37 percent when you count everything that happens up to uh, the tailpipe. So in order to get the proper sort of systems perspective, we look at this from a life cycle uh, systems basis. So life cycle assessment, LCA, is a technique for assessing the potential environmental aspects associated with a product or a service by first 
process of all compiling an inventory of all the things that go in and the things that come out of your system, evaluating the potential environmental impacts associated with those inputs and outputs, uh, and then interpreting the results of the inventory and the impact phases uh, to the objective. So that's a particular definition from the US EPA. You can find other definitions for LCA. What they have in common is they're all action oriented. So compiling, evaluating, uh, interpreting. It's a, it's a very proactive uh, kind of process uh, as opposed to the accounting of uh, greenhouse gas emission inventories. So this is a, a sort of a life cycle stages. Uh, typically, you know, we take things out of the ground, uh, we expend some energy with raw materials, we acquire them, we manufacture, process, formulate, distribute, transport, use them, maintain them, uh, deal with the products at the end of the system, uh, and then we look at what comes out of it in terms of effluents and air emissions, solid waste, etc., and we get some value. We have some product, we get some service. There's a dotted line uh, around that, which is the system boundary. So when we do life cycle analysis, we define the system boundary, we, and that um, tells us everything that we need to look in uh, and coming out of that particular system. Why we do life cycle assessment is it helps decision makers select options with the lowest environmental impact. Uh, it gets used with other uh, sources of information to, uh, such as the cost and the performance to make choices. Companies could claim that one product works better than another. So a lot of LCA work uh, <laughs> is done in Europe and new wider and brighter tide in Europe or new tide in Europe might not mean wider and brighter, it might mean lower environmental impact. The LCA inventory process helps narrow in on the area where the biggest reductions in environmental emissions uh, can take place. Generally speaking, if you are spending money, you are creating emissions. Uh, and the opposite is true. If you have emissions, you're spending money. So when you go through this process, it can also be used to reduce production costs. And back in 2008, I did some work for a oil sands uh, producer and uh, they wanted to understand what the carbon footprint of their various operations was. Uh, and so I said, fine, I can do that. Uh, I can use my model and, and give you that information. And here's the list of data that I require to do this work. Uh, and so their primary operation was a 50-50 joint venture. They weren't the operator. So they had to send the data request to the operator. And so the numbers that came back from the operator uh, immediately raised my suspicion because A, they were round, like 1.5 gigajoules uh, per ton, uh, and I don't believe anybody gets 1.5000. Uh, and of course they were also at the very bottom of the range that you find in the literature. So I sent an email back and said, are you sure these are your numbers? And then the response came, well, what numbers do you want? Mm -hmm. uh, and then it turned out that I found they had put some numbers in the public domain. At the end of the project, when I did the work, the guy that I was working for said, this was a really successful project for us because not only did we find the answers that we were looking for for carbon footprints, but it turns out that our partner was spending $50 million a month on natural gas and we never ever saw a bill. So you'll know that our management process has now been changed and we sign off on every bill over $10,000 a month. Uh, and so uh, it can be used to reduce uh, costs. There are international standards that have been developed for life cycle assessment. There's a whole bunch of them, uh, some very broad general ones uh, that talk about some principles. So when we look at all this stuff, we look at it from a true life cycle perspective. So we go all the way back uh, to the point where we're dealing with something of value that we're taking out of the earth. We have a focus on environmental issues. Uh, we always look at these things compared to something else. So what's option A versus option B? Uh, and we try to make that comparison on equivalent basis. So we're always comparing apples and apples, not comparing apples and oranges. Um, that's the objective, not everyone accomplishes that. It's an iterative approach, so we set off, 
set out trying to establish you know how much we want to look at we want to cover off 98 percent of the inputs going into the system and then we go to look for the data well you know it turns out we might not be able to get 90 eight percent and we have to dial it back a little bit and be uh, comfortable with 95 so we sort of go through this several times um, and we try to be transparent so one of the aspects of this is if you use it for marketing kinds of purposes it's supposed to be audited by someone else you can give your whole data set to another group that will go through it and hopefully get exactly the same answer it needs to be comprehensive. You need to be looking at everything. It really is looking at 95 or 96 or 97 percent of what goes into the system um, and, uh, and not just half. And we want to have a priority of scientific approach. So it, as much as I'm a numbers guy and I'm an engineer, uh, there is some art in terms of life cycle assessments because you can never do everything that you want to do and so you need to make some compromises uh, and you know there's a clause in terms of how you deal with multiple products that come out of systems and first of all you try to make sure maybe you can break it into two systems both make one product makes product A the other system makes product B if you can't do that maybe allocate emissions on um, basis of mass or energy, some physical um, attribute. Uh, and then if all else fails, you can go to the social sciences and uh, use economics or something like that. So th those are the kinds of things that we try to do when we look at life cycle assessment. Uh, so this is what the gasoline uh, system looks like. You know, we go back right to the point where the crude oil is uh, coming out of the ground. Uh, we're looking at crude oil production, so all the energy that goes into that. We're looking at fugitive emissions uh, that come out of that system. We transport that energy, oil or gas, uh, through some means, through, through trucks or pipelines, uh, rail cars. We take it to a refinery. Uh, we look at all the inputs to the refinery, the internally pr uh, produced fuels that get consumed. Uh, we transport the products that come out uh, by pipeline or truck or rail or whatever, go to a service station, uh, and then we use the emissions uh, in the vehicle. So there's a lot of data that goes into this uh, kind uh, of analysis, uh, and we come up with some numbers that are geographically specific, because oil and gas systems are different um, all around the world. Uh, and we also come up with answers that are temporally specific because things happen uh, that change the systems all the time. Uh, so greenhouse gases from that whole system of producing the gasoline and using the car, 75% or so comes from the vehicle and the other 25% comes from all of the different stuff uh, upstream. Um, so we look at the same kind of system from a biofuel perspective. We are trying to go back again to the production of the feedstock. Uh, so that might require fertilizer. So we look at the emissions of, of producing the fertilizer and, and moving it to the field. Uh, the uh, fuel for the tractors that go around the field, the energy that went into, into uh, pesticides, uh, breakdown of uh, nitrogen fertilizers and crop residues uh, on the field that create N2O emissions. Depending on how we do that, we might increase or reduce soil carbon, so we're looking at that as part of the life cycle as well. You know, we truck the wheat in this particular case from the farm to the ethanol plant. At the ethanol plant, we make ethanol and we have the sewage grains that are left over, so we have a co-product to use, uh, and then we get into the rest of the system uh, in terms of uh, a blending point where it's used in the refinery uh, through fuel dispensing and finally the vehicle uh, uh, operation. Except for a biofuel, when we look at the vehicle operation, we're really only interested in methane and N2O uh, that comes out the tailpipe because the CO2 originally came uh, from the atmosphere. <laughs>
So um, I have a model called GH Genius uh, that I've been developing for the last 15 years. Uh, originally got supported by Natural Resources Canada, but since 2013, uh, under the old regime, uh, they lost interest in science, uh, and it was giving the masters that weren't particularly supportive of their particular view of the world, uh, and so they stopped supporting the model. Uh, since that time, uh, I've continued to develop the model uh, um, with input from a lot of companies. I did big projects in Europe. Uh, so it's got a very large Canadian database uh, of activities, uh, and uh, as well as some US data and some European data. So I can look at doing exactly the same thing in Canada and the United States and see what the difference is in the energy into the system and the emissions uh, through the system. I can regionalize this. So I've got seven regions in Canada, you know, all the provinces through to Quebec and then the Maritimes sort of lumped together. Uh, because data is a big part of what, what goes into the model. So I can tell you that 0.59 kilograms per kilowatt hour is not the grid intensity on a life cycle basis of electricity in Alberta. It is Alberta's estimate of the marginal uh, production electricity for new capacity brought onto the grid. So that's the 0.59, uh, that's where it comes from. The actual carbon intensity of grid electricity in Alberta is about 0.9, uh, maybe even a little bit higher depending uh, on what happens. Uh, and there's actually not very many people in Alberta who really know what's going on because Alberta is the only province in Canada that has two sets of books when it comes to electricity. So they have a set of books that is the total electricity generated in the province, and they have another set of books that is the total electricity that goes into the grid. So there is a big gap uh, between those two numbers, and the difference is natural gas-fired cogen at industrial facilities where that power never leaves the site. Um, and uh, if you look at those, Alberta has less than 50% coal-fired electricity, and if you looked at what goes into the grid, it's still 60 to 65%. Um, uh, and the model also has time series of data, so we use it for projections. So some of my data series go back 100 years um, and use that data to project forward. So this is a way of, of making sure the model stays fresh. Um, so while I'm continually updating the data series in the model, um, it, it if I move the year, model year from 2015 to 2017, I get different answers out of the model because there's a lot of stuff happening in the world uh, that's changed. So, uh, let's say we have a wheat ethanol plant um, in the province of Alberta, uh, which you do have, but I've modeled a very standard wheat uh, ethanol plant. Uh, gasoline emissions uh, for the production and use of gasoline uh, in Alberta, 95 kilograms of CO2 per gigajoule of gasoline. Uh, and this wheat ethanol plant is at 48 um, gigajoules, so about a 50% reduction in GHG emissions. Uh, you actually have an ethanol plant in Alberta that has better numbers than this uh, because they don't dry um, any of the coal products, they use less energy uh, going into the system. So at the very highest level, um, there is about a 50% reduction in GHG emissions per unit of energy uh, delivered by gasoline versus ethanol. The problem is that there are some other things that are happening in the system that are hard to uh, get a handle on because we're not keeping track uh, of the data. So on a pure energy content basis, we get 50% reduction, uh, but there is significant evidence that an ethylene, ethanol gasoline blend burns with higher efficiency than a pure gasoline blend. Uh, so ethanol has about a third less um, energy per liter than gasoline, uh, but when we put 10% ethanol in the gasoline, we don't see the fuel economy go down by 3.5%. Uh, and you know maybe it goes down by two and a half percent, maybe even less, uh, and that actually makes a big difference. So one percent difference between two and a half and uh, three and a half percent is ten kilograms per gigajoule. Uh, 
The other thing that's happening is that the refiners don't blend ethanol with 87 octane gasoline. So they blend it with 84 octane gasoline. The ethanol brings the octane back up to 87, and so the refiners can actually use less energy in their facilities, and less energy means less greenhouse gas emissions uh, to produce the same 87 octane fuel. Uh, and so uh, we get further reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. So in actual likelihood, the actual greenhouse gas emissions are probably more than 80% uh, for, uh, for ethanol compared to uh, gasoline, in this particular case, in the province of Alberta. Uh, so the refiners have actually started to brag about um, how they've been reducing the energy intensity of the refineries. They don't tell everybody how they've done that, but I've taken sort of this period from 2006 to 2014 and, and layered on the amount of ethanol that's going into the gasoline pool and as one goes up, the other goes down. Um, so uh, I'm pretty sure that, uh, uh, that that's what's happening, but I have not yet seen a refiner admit that in public. Uh, so, Western Canadian advantage. What, uh, what might be different here than in other places around the world? So, um, this past uh, year, I've got a project going on for what's called uh, the Canadian Roundtable on Sustainable Crops, where I'm looking at the carbon footprint for the 10 major crops in Canada on a regional basis. So split the country into 20 ag producing regions and I'm doing a carbon footprint for wheat, corn, soybeans, flax, barley, canola, whatever the other 10 are, lentils, peas, uh, it, for each of those regions. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was what is the carbon footprint of fertilizer production uh, in Canada? So the we tried to work with uh, Fertilizers Canada. Um, they wanted to be very cooperative, but in the end of the day, they weren't able to supply <coughs> real information. So we, a uh, company that I worked with in Toronto, uh, went into the public database sets, so reported emissions for uh, greenhouse gas emissions to Environment Canada. Some of the fertilizer companies actually give a lot of detail about what their operations were, and so we were able to develop carbon footprints for the Canadian uh, fertilizer sector. And so it turns out that they have a good news story to tell, which they haven't been telling. So nitrogen for the the carbon footprint of nitrogen fertilizer production in Canada is about half of the global average. And that's not necessarily because we're a lot more energy efficient, um, but in part it's because we produce different kinds of fertilizers. So, you know, we don't use very much ammonium nitrate um, uh, in agriculture in Canada, and ammonium nitrate has very high GHG emissions because they lose, they lose N2O in the production process. Our potash emission intensity is a quarter of the global average. You know, I mean, we're the world leaders uh, in potash production. The only area where we fall down is potash, is phosphorus, because that gets mined in Morocco and put on a boat and sent to Montreal or Vancouver and put on a rail car and uh, sent to uh, Alberta. So those emissions are higher. So we have some advantage in terms of the efficiency of fertilizer production and the types of fertilizer that we use in Canada. And depending on the crop, makes a big difference. So if you've got canola, where you're putting a lot of nitrogen on, that makes a big difference for Canadian canola carbon footprint versus canola grown in Germany or the UK. Um, and then the other thing we, that David talked about this morning is building soil carbon. So we are building soil carbon uh, in Western Canada and it's because we have a uh, reduced summer fallow. So we have crop residues going back on the field every year instead of every other year or two out of three years. Uh, we have this reduced uh, uh, till and no-till um, cultivation where you know, we have fields in, Canada, in Western Canada that haven't seen a plow in 20 or 30 years. Um, and in Western Canada, we've seen an increase in perennials. So we have less area in annuals and more in perennials. But it turns out in Eastern Canada, we have the exact 
opposite has happened. Um, and so for some crops and regions, up to 50% of the total GHG emissions can be offset by the increase uh, in soil carbon. And so if we cut our carbon footprint by half, um, that, has, that has a big impact. So I did work for the Canola Council initially five years ago who wanted to make sure that they had access to the European market. Um, to get access for canola oil into the European market to make biodiesel, you had to meet certain GHG emission thresholds. The default value in Europe was 690 kilograms per ton of rapeseed. It turns out that the Canadian average was about 330 kilograms per ton. So half of the emissions uh, that they had in uh, Germany. And it took a little while for some of the German farmers to get over that fact, but uh, in the end uh, they did accept that. Uh, so this is a map from uh, Ag Canada that shows building soil carbon in Western Canada and losing soil carbon in Eastern Canada. This is a little misleading because in Eastern Canada we are increasing soil carbon because of reduced tillage, but we have this increase in annuals versus perennials. And some of that is, is decisions that were made 20 and 30 years ago, and some of it is, a, is as a result of changing government policy. You know, so in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we used to subsidize the shipment of Western Canadian feed grains to Ontario so they could raise their animals there. Uh, we stopped doing that, and the feed grains stopped going there, and the animals came west. And so area that used to grow forward just to support the livestock sector in the east, uh, no market for it, so they switched to annuals. And this particular modeling scenario that Canada runs through actually goes all the way back to 1951. Uh, and so even if you changed 30 years ago from a perennial to an annual, it's still showing up as carbon losses uh, in today. And so that's why we have these negative uh, values uh, in the east. If we look at the annual to perennial transitions east to west, they actually almost balance each other out and they're not the same. And in total, we're building 13 megatons a year of uh, carbon. So production in Western Canada is also generally moisture limited. Many other regions of the world get a lot higher yields than we get in Western Canada. But the benefit of the low moisture is we also get less of the nitrogen in crop residues and fertilizers converted to N2O. And so again, depending on the crop, that makes a big difference. So canola, nitrogen dependent, Western Canadian N2O emissions are a lot less than they are in Europe. Food and fuel, Crop production in Canada in the last five years has been above the long-term trend line. We have an increase in pro crop production at the same time as we have a reduction in cropland. Grain and oil sea exports continue to increase despite increased use of crops for biofuels. And our long-term export trend is about 3.5% per year. So every year we're exporting more than 3.5%. And higher productivity in the livestock sector, reduced per capita meat consumption, and changing meat species are reducing demand for land for animal feed in Canada and in the developed world. So David this morning talked about maybe these are things that could happen in the future. They are happening today. So I give a talk called Peak Beef. So in North America, beef consumption per capita peaked in 1975. We have been reducing beef consumption in North America for 40 years. Uh, for a long time, we continue to eat more meat, but even in the last 10 years, our meat consumption has started to decline. And that combined with increased feed efficiencies in the livestock sector mean that in the United States, they, have, they are now using 40 million acres less land to produce the feed for livestock than they did in 1980. So big changes, uh, and that 40 million acres is more than the land that's been used to grow uh, crops for biofuels. So biofuel production uh, and use offer significant reductions in GHG emissions, and Western Canada crop production has uh, one of the lowest carbon footprints in the world, and the two big, biggest drivers are we're building soil carbon, and we have low N2O emissions because it's dry here. <laughs>